In the last video, we saw lots of new ways we could use pointers in our C programs. In this video, I want to draw some stack diagrams to help us reason about what's going on when we use pointers to access various things in memory, and when we allocate and deallocate dynamic memory on the heap. We've seen in various reading assignments from the textbook this diagram of the memory layout of a C program. The segments of memory in this diagram each store different sorts of data. The operating system segment has to do with how your program interacts with the operating system, and you can't access this segment directly. The text segment is where the code of your program lives. So when we see addresses next to the assembly instructions of our program in the debugger, those addresses live somewhere in the text segment. The data segment stores any global variables for the program, and all three of these segments have a total size that can be determined in advance by the compiler. But as our program is running, it may need to dynamically allocate memory, and it can do that by growing the function stack, calling more functions and therefore getting more space for local variables, or by calling malloc to allocate space in the heap segment. The heap segment and the stack segment grow towards each other and in principle could meet if your program uses all of its address space. But if we want to reason about how our programs operate, it's only occasionally helpful to think about this diagram with its explicit memory addresses. Most of the time, it's much more convenient to think about a slightly more abstract representation, which we do by drawing a stack diagram. So we should think about how do pointers and dynamic memory show up in a stack diagram so that we can reason about the operation of our programs that use pointers and dynamic memory. As with any program, this one begins executing at the top of main, and so we get a stack frame for the main function. And within this stack frame should appear all of the local variables of main. So we have i, p, a, and f. i is an int variable, and at the start of the program we initialize its value to zero. p is a pointer variable, and we initialize its value to null. Null is actually the address 0x0, and it is always an invalid address. It is a very good idea whenever you declare a pointer variable to initialize it to null, because that ensures that it won't be pointing to somewhere random based on whatever happened to be in that chunk of memory when your program started. Instead, by initializing it to null, we ensure that it is not pointing anywhere, and so if we try to follow it, the program will immediately crash, rather than having weird undefined behavior. On our stack diagram, we draw a null pointer by having a pointer that terminates immediately. So we know that pointer variables are actually storing some memory address, but we draw them on the stack diagram with an arrow to the place that they're pointing. But a null pointer is deliberately pointing nowhere, and so we start our arrow and then immediately terminate it. But now on the third line of main, we store the address of i into our pointer variable p. Remember that the ampersand operator in C gives us the address where something is stored. And so this gives us the address within main's stack frame where the variable i is stored. And so we are then assigning that address into our pointer p. And so here we are making this pointer point to the location where we are storing i. On the next line, we are setting the thing that p points to to 5. So remember that the star operator on a pointer is known as the dereference operator, and it means that we are following the pointer and operating on the thing that it points to. So we are assigning the value 5 into the thing that p points to.
And since p is pointing to this location in memory, we are assigning the value 5 into that location. Then we are calling our zeros function, and we are passing in the value of i. And so, since we just updated that value to 5, we are calling zeros and passing in 5. When we call this function, we get a new stack frame to hold all of its local variables. And in this stack frame, we have local variables len, z, and i. And we know that len was the argument of the function, and we passed in 5. So this has the value 5. And we are initializing z to point to nothing. But then, on the second line of this function, we are assigning into z the return value of the malloc function. So when we call malloc, that allocates memory in the heap segment. In our stack diagrams, we can draw the heap as a messy pile of data. So because the stack and the heap are separate regions of memory, we draw the heap separately from the stack. And whereas in the stack region, we know that each function goes on top of the previous one, in the heap segment, we don't know how our data is going to be laid out. So we will just put somewhere in the heap segment a chunk of memory that is being allocated by malloc. In this case, we are calling malloc and we are passing in size of int times len. But this is a bug in my code. Since I am assigning into a float pointer, what I'm trying to allocate here is an array of floats. And so I should be asking for space to store this many floats, not this many ints. I might have gotten lucky and both float and int take the same amount of space on my computer, but we should definitely fix this. So size of float tells us how big a float is in memory, and we are allocating length times that many bytes. And so now we are allocating space for this many floats. And so we can draw that on the heap as a single chunk of memory that is an array of five floats. So having allocated room for five floats on the heap, malloc now returns the address where that chunk of memory begins. And we are assigning the address that malloc gives us into the variable z. And so that means that we are making z point to that array of floats that lives on the heap. Now we enter our for loop and i is initially zero. And then we are on each iteration of this loop, incrementing i and assigning into the ith element of this array the value 0.0. .0. So by the time we get to the end of this loop, we will have filled in all five entries in this array. And when we finish the loop, i, which got incremented and is no longer less than len, will have the value 5. So this is the state of our program when we have finished executing this loop. And now we are returning z. If we had allocated z as a normal array where it lived in the stack frame for this function, then we wouldn't be able to return it because when we return from the function, the stack frame goes away. But since we allocated z to point to some dynamic memory, this dynamic memory doesn't go away until we free it, and so we can return 
the address that's stored in this pointer and assign it into a pointer in the main function. So we can still keep track of this chunk of dynamic memory we allocated by passing a pointer back and forth between different functions. So when we return z, the value of z, which is a memory address, gets returned from the function. And so the function's return value is being assigned into the variable a. So when we come back to main and resume execution after the function call, we will assign a the same address that was stored in z, which means that we are making the a pointer point to the same location that the z pointer points to. But now that we have returned from our call to the zeros function, the stack frame for that function goes away. And from here we proceed with our main function. We initialize our variable f to null. And then we reach this for loop where we will set i to zero. And then in the loop, we will set f to point to a plus i. So a is pointing to the first element of this array of floats. And when we add to a pointer variable, we are adding an amount that is in terms of the size of the things that this pointer points to. So since a is a float pointer variable, when we add to a, we are adding increments of the size of a float. So initially, that increment i is 0. And so we are initially setting f to point to the zeroth element of this array. And then we are assigning a value into the thing that f points to. So since f is pointing to element 0, we are modifying the zeroth bucket of the array. And we are assigning into it 1 divided by the thing that p points to plus 1. So p is pointing to this location. So we are getting the value that p points to, adding 1. So this evaluates to 1. And so we are assigning 1.0 divided by 1 into the location where f is pointing. So we are assigning 1.0 into the zeroth bucket. Now we come back to the top of the loop. We increment i to 1. It's still less than 5, so we execute the loop again. And now we set f to a plus 1. Since a is a float pointer, plus 1 will take us one float past where a is pointing. And so that will make f point to bucket 1 of the array. And now we are assigning into the place where f is pointing 1 divided by the thing p points to plus 1. So p is pointing to a 1. So this evaluates to 2. So this evaluates to 0 0.5. And we are assigning that into bucket 1. On the next iteration, i becomes 2. f now points to a plus 2. This now evaluates to 3, and so we get 1 over 3. And so we get the float that most closely approximates 1 third, assigned into bucket 2. We come back to the loop. We increment i. We assign f to point to a plus 3. And this now evaluates to 4. So we assign 0.25 into that bucket. We come back to the top of the loop. We increment i. i less than 5 still evaluates to true. So we assign f to a plus 4. 
We calculate 1 divided by 5 and assign 0.2 into the last bucket. Now we come back to the top of the loop. We increment i again. Now the loop condition is false, so we skip over the body and come down to the bottom. So this is the state of our stack diagram before we call free. But what free does is it takes a pointer to a chunk of memory that we previously allocated with malloc, which this was. Malloc gave us back this address where the array begins. And now we are giving to malloc a pointer to the address where the array begins. So we are asking for that chunk of memory to be freed. And so this has the result that the memory on the heap is no longer allocated. And so A and F are now storing addresses on the heap that no longer correspond to valid data since that memory was just freed. And so we assign into the pointer that we just freed the value null. This is important to ensure that we don't later try to follow that pointer and access data that is no longer valid. And so it is good programming practice that every time you call free, you immediately assign the value null into the pointer that you just freed to make sure that it is no longer pointing to invalid memory. And in this case, we have another pointer that is not the one that we just freed, but it does point to memory that is no longer valid, and so we should also assign null into the pointer f, ensuring that we don't try to follow the f pointer and get undefined behavior later. So the big takeaways here are the ampersand operator for giving the address of a variable, the star operator or dereference operator for following a pointer, and that when we call malloc, we are allocating data on the heap, which we can draw in the stack diagram as having a separate region for heap memory, and then we can pass around pointers to that dynamically allocated memory until when we're done with it, we should call free, and set any pointers to that memory to null.